Hi everyone, uh, my name's Adrian Warnock. It's actually been a while since I've done one of these interviews, uh, but I'm here today with a good friend of mine called Elle. Um, so Elle, first of all, why don't you tell everyone how you and I met? Um, yeah, hi everyone. I met Adrian through Shine, um, the Shine breakout group, which was, you know, six weeks and we met up every week and it was such a great opportunity to meet people and, and talk about our cancer experience and Adrian um, was another person with blood cancer so you know we had similar stories in a way. Yes I mean similar and different isn't it Elle which is which yeah. is you know, maybe some of that will come out in today's um, conversation so you know um, usually when I do these it is very much a conversation and so obviously Elle and I you know we do know each other but I don't know every detail of Elle's story because of course when you're in a sort of support group type environment as we were for those few weeks where we were also being taught by the fantastic people at Shine Cancer. So big, big plug for that. If you're um, if you're in the UK and you have any type of blood cancer, actually, it's not exclusive to blood cancer, any type of cancer, it's not exclusive to blood cancer. And you're in your, your 20s, your 30s or your 40s, um, then that's a really great group to go and uh, be a part of. And, and um, I know for me, it really helped me kind of process my my journey and maybe before we get into the details of yours Eleanor would you agree I mean what else would you say about that that group that we were in together yeah for me it just came at like the perfect timing because I just gone into remission and I was feeling quite lost and I I hadn't I hadn't felt that like happiness about remission as I thought I would and so it was just that place for me to go and process everything that had just happened in that whirlwind of a, you know, six months or whatever, six, seven months. Um, and so that was really, really important. And by the end of it, I definitely felt, felt like a lot lighter um, after every session, actually. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think part of the thing, isn't it, as you said, was meeting other people who, who kind of understood what you were going through. And um you know, who, who understood the journey. And I remember actually you talking about how, you know, having just got into remission, you didn't feel the way you quote, quote, should, and the way everyone was telling you that you must be feeling. Um, and I, I very strongly resonated with that. And in fact, uh, if I remember when I post this, um, certainly on our website, so this will be going up on bloodcanceruncensored.com if anyone's watching this somewhere else. Um, and then the version there, and if I remember, I'll put it on, on other places where I can, I'll put a link to an article I wrote about um, how I felt when I went into remission and how I actually I said that, for me anyway, remission at the time almost felt like a crushing blow. Um, it wasn't like the way everyone said. I remember sitting in a room with a consultant, eminent consultant, you know, telling me, Adrian, it's great news, you know, you're your bone marrow is clear of cancer at the moment. We can't find it with our tests. I mean, our tests are quite sensitive. But then he said there almost certainly is some left for me. And this might be an interesting conversation for you in terms of your situation, because he said to me, it almost certainly will grow back in your case, Adrian, at some point. So this isn't like you're cured, which is what I think some of my friends and family thought when they heard the word remission. And for me, I was told that I had, you know, great news. You've got a two in three chance, I was told, of, of making it to five or, I can't remember if it was five or six years, I think five more years um, without it coming back. And I remember for two, two, for me personally, there were two things that hit me at that moment. First was, well, that's a one in three chance of me having to go through all of this again in, in just five years. That's, that's not brilliant. Because I mean, like, would you go bungee jumping if it had a one in three chance of the rope breaking? breaking? I don't think you would, you know? And then the second thing for me, and, and this is maybe what you can sort of chip in a bit more about, is I felt like, well, I feel so rubbish. I feel so ill. I'm still not anywhere near um, at that point, you know, being able to work. And I'm still not, by the way. Um, but, but I just thought like, if this is the best I'm gonna feel because the cancer's gone or more or less gone, then, what a depressing life I've got. And it sort of, all the trauma hit me as well. I mean, was that the same for you? Yeah, I think I hadn't had any chance to process it throughout. I was running on fumes all the way throughout my treatment. And then afterwards, I think, you know, it was just very, very, very anticlimactic. I was, I was told over the phone you know, like two minute phone call, I think it was with my nurse. Yeah, because um, you're, you're, let's just say for the audience that you're a, you're, you're a COVID 
cancer person aren't yeah you? so that's, that's yeah that's the other thing is that I was told of the phone because you know, well not actually I was going to go in anyway to get my results but my nurse was just so excited that he phoned me um and he wanted me to know as soon as possible which was another thing because I felt like I was going to psych myself up on the day of my appointment and I was actually told a day before and actually I so I knew for a whole day I didn't tell anyone hmm. I just was like uh what because I, I hadn't psyched myself up like either way um and anyway yeah I was it was still lockdown it was the third lockdown in the UK um and so I couldn't do anything anyway I couldn't do anything to celebrate and it just felt like what do we do and like I just remember I went down to my my family and I just said everyone come into the kitchen for a moment I've, I've gone into metabolic remission because I, I was just repeating what my nurse had said and my parents were like does that mean does that mean like you're clear and I was like I think so D like it says remission so I, he said remission so I'm guessing so um and we were just kind of like oh okay and then just went our ways our separate ways like hmm. it was in the middle of the day everyone was still had work so it was just kind of like huh okay I guess I'll get back to uni work then. And that was that. It wasn't anything big or special. And I didn't feel anything big or special. And how I described it was that I didn't feel cancer. I didn't feel it in me. And so I didn't feel it missing. Hmm. So I didn't feel when it had gone. And so it doesn't feel like it just feels like you've gone through six months of torture your everything has completely changed and you don't feel much better for it mm. <laughs> yeah I mean I suppose it's a bit like supposing you'd been in prison for six months being tortured it was just like you out and then in the, oh look be happy you're out and in the way I guess you are but at the same time you've just come out of that trauma yeah, I mean, yeah, don't get me wrong. I was happy to be done with chemotherapy. Yes. But it it is a very weird psychological thing that, you know, I didn't have any symptoms apart from a lump on my neck. Mm. So I genuinely didn't feel ill from cancer. But I felt ill from the treatment. Very, very ill. And then to go through that and come out the other side, a completely different person, like, appearance wise and ability wise just felt like what have I done all of this for because I didn't feel it in the first place it was it was quite hard I wasn't conscious of it of me trying to process this but you know later on I have been it's quite hard to wrap your head around that and yeah and feel okay with it yeah 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 I, I mean you're absolutely right and I think um one of the interesting things, and this is perhaps, you know, obviously big part of this, this video is to sort of raise awareness of people with blood cancers of all types, but specifically, obviously your, your type, we'll come to that in a minute, um, and acute blood cancers, chronic blood cancers, all of them, you know, in one sense, one thing we all have in common is it's trauma. And if you're going to be treated, it's trauma. If you're going to be diagnosed, it's trauma. And then when you come out the other end, you know, you don't feel the same. And that, that was one of the things that came out in our group, actually, as well, that none of us felt the same. You know, we all felt you almost like look in the mirror and it's like, who's looking back? Mm. Now, I had a complete. I still sometimes do a complete identity crisis. Hmm. I just didn't I didn't recognize myself. I still in my mind's eye, I am the person that I was before cancer. And it just comes, it comes down to the most minute, almost like trivial things. Like if I'm writing a text, right? I don't know which emoji to use because I don't, usually in the past, I've always used the blonde girl, you know? Mm, what with the long I'm hair? Not, or? Yeah, yeah. I'm not that emoji anymore. I still use it because that's in my mind's eye. I still look like that. And I forget that I don't look like that when I meet new people as well. And um so it's it's just another whole thing that when I was going through it, 
I didn't even think about because it was just the last of my priorities. I didn't care about losing my hair at the time because I just, it was just like, oh, just get me through this. I don't care. Um, but afterwards it's like, oh, right. Now I'm stuck with this look. I'm stuck with this. Mm. Great. What do I do now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. I mean, some people obviously would choose to look like you do now, Elle, and you know, you do look lovely, but at the same time, it's like, that wasn't your choice, was it? Yeah, as a reference, I had a uh, like blonde bob. Um, mm. Yeah, and I'm also I was also quite physically fit as well. Um, yeah, and that changed. That changed a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I mean, it's almost like we're doing a spoiler here, but I mean, that's it's good to do that in a way to start at the end. <laughs> and yeah, then that's so the thing. But I think it's interesting what you said as well, because like um, this whole business about awareness, I mean, you know, Blood Cancer UK and some of the other blood cancer charities do this whole kind of awareness thing and trying to make sure people are aware of, of symptoms and, and signs that they're supposed to do something about. Uh, and of course, one of the sad things is that sometimes people have a lump in the neck and, and they ignore it. And I mean, it's worth saying at this point, isn't it, that the vast majority of people who get a lump in their neck, it is probably going to be, if they're a young person, something like glandular fever or whatever, whatever. Mm. And I know that because that I've seen that in my own family where, where somebody had a huge lump appear and, and then disappear. Um, and, and obviously they got the diagnosis of glandular fever and then you say, oh, phew, thank goodness for that. But like some people I think don't necessarily ask for help straight away. What what led you to sort of realize that you needed to, 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 to go to the doctor or... or so my my initial reaction was that I'd slept funny mm -hmm. um and because I had slept funny my neck was hurting and that's how I massaged my neck and that's how I, I found it oh I see so so in a way it's almost a good thing that you slept funny that day because you yeah. might have noticed yeah. it or at least not it earlier is, I when I then looked in the mirror and I saw it I was like that has come out of nowhere mm. um how big was and it I it was I would say it was like that big. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just so there. noticeable then, but but not only. Yeah, you... it, it was quite underneath. Um, but yeah, it came up like this, I'd say. Like it, you didn't have that, you wouldn't see be able to see that curve in my neck, basically. All right. So so do you think it had been there for a little while then, or do you think it had literally come up? I, I have no idea. And um and basically what happened, um was that so I've had glandular fever I had glandular fever when I was um 17 mm -hmm. and that really wiped me out I actually I did school part-time because of glandular fever so right. that was really bad for me um and my initial thought went to glandular fever mm -hmm. but it was quite low down um and you know still I, I've always had problems with my throat and tonsillitis and all of that so I, I went to my mum um, and I was just sort of like, I found this. It's just, I, I don't know what's happened. I don't know whether it's like a knot, like, you know, how you get in your back. Mm. And I just slept funny and it's come to my neck. And my mum just instantly, mums are like, I don't like lumps. Call the doctor. What? So I called the doctor and that was... Good mum, eh? Good mum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, honestly, it, I say this with caution because I know how horrible the pandemic has been, but... Uh, it was almost a blessing in disguise for me because if it weren't for the pandemic, I would have still been living in Spain. And if I was living in Spain at the time, I probably wouldn't have gotten checked out as quickly as wow. I Wow. That's, that's, it's amazing how things work out like that sometimes, isn't it? That, yeah. you know, that um, some people would say, oh, that's the universe looking out for you. And obviously some people would have faith and say it was God looking out for you. But whatever your position on that it, it, it's, it's good <laughs> it's it's yeah. a good thing that, that that happened that way for you um yeah I think for me it's just a point of being grateful for um mm. and then so I called the doctor and I think it was a Friday or a Thursday and he was like oh well, that's weird it's come out of nowhere um have a keep looking over it over the weekend and if it if it's gotten any bigger um then I'll get you in for some blood tests um, next week. And over the weekend, um, 
it got to Monday and I had a feel around my neck and I found another lump. Um, and that's when I was like, this is not normal and this is not my glands. Um, and I still, but I still wasn't like, mm, like, I, you know, I personally, my mind didn't go straight to cancer. I only went to cancer because when my mum mentioned it. Um, and then I had blood tests for glandular fever. Um, I had a COVID test um, because my doctor thought it might be like a weird reaction to COVID, you know, something they hadn't seen. But he basically then had a feel around. Oh, so you few... actually got to see a doctor in the pandemic. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Um, just because he was quite concerned. Mm. Um, he had a feel around and he found a few more. So I had I had a, the blood test for... So these were small, the ones that he found, presumably, if you hadn't seen. Yeah, so he found one here that was quite sizable, to be fair, and then a few more, like, peas around here. Mm -hmm. um, and... Yeah, I had my blood test for glandular fever uh, for, I guess, my, my white blood cells and um, a COVID test. And, and I presume for you, if I know, if I've got my head right, was the white was the white blood cell test normal or was that abnormal for you? It all came back normal. Yeah, yeah, because that's that's one of the misconceptions people have about blood cancer is that oh yeah just send off a blood test and you'll you'll see on a simple blood test that's true for some blood cancers you would see i mean for mine um my lymphocyte count was really high um but that's because mine was was growing in the blood um and so that's they often call that leukemia um although mine's a bit weird because it's a leukemia and a lymphoma um but yours because it was a lymphoma it, there would have been no abnormality certainly not on a normal blood test anyway a basic blood full blood count it wouldn't have been detected so what did they do then if it came back with normal blood results what was the next step yeah I think unfortunately I was told that it it, it wasn't lymphoma because it all came back clear wow so that's that's unfortunate because obviously um you know that a normal blood test does rule out certain types of blood cancer like mine but it doesn't rule out other types yeah. of cancer like yours yeah, so on one hand, that it was unfortunate, but on the other hand, I did have a very good doctor who then went to dig further. Mm -hmm. So he didn't just leave me. Well, that's good. And that's thing. a really important point, isn't it? If you've got a lump or if you've got, you know, things like fatigue or achy bones or all these other symptoms that you, you can see listed on those websites, they can all be a bit nonspecific. And 90% of the time, they don't necessarily mean blood cancer. And that's why it's so important that either you and or your doctor pursue these things sometimes to find out what the problem is. And the way I often say to people is to rule out blood cancer, you know? And obviously at this point, the GP thought he had ruled out blood cancer, but he didn't give up on finding out what was going on. So that's good. And if your GP, if it feels like they're giving up, then sometimes the patient has to push um, mm -hmm. to, 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 to go to the next level. So what was the next thing he did? So the next thing was a referral to uh, ear, nose, throat department at the hospital. Okay, that, um, that kind of makes sense, yeah. Yeah, um, and it was just kind of trying to find out what it was because he just didn't think it was cancer and he didn't think it was COVID and didn't think it was glandular fever. Um, so I had a biopsy. And was um, that done quite quickly, by the way, Elle, that appointment? I think that was within like two weeks or something, mm -hmm. or maybe... Yeah, because it was a it was a two week um, rule thing, an uh, urgency scan thing. So, so, so he must have he must have still been sort of not one hundred percent sure it wasn't cancer. Just thought it wasn't blood cancer then. Because yeah, a two uh, week he, thing is for cancer, isn't it? Did he tell you yeah, that? Did he not tell you. No, that? he didn't tell me that. It was more like I'm going to put this through as a two week cancer scan. But don't worry, I don't think it's that. Okay. Yeah, the GPs do that a lot actually because. Um, in the UK, if you want things done quickly, um, if you put it query cancer, then they'll do it in two weeks. So that's actually that's actually something useful because I I know a lot of people find um, our site sometimes when they're worrying that they've got blood cancer. And, um, you know, obviously, in your case, it was blood cancer. In my case, it was blood cancer. But for many people with the sort of position you were in, it would have turned out to be something else. And so uh, it's 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 important to to realize that just because you've been referred in that, that two week cancer rule, that it doesn't necessarily mean that's what you've got. But of course, it must have played on your mind a little bit, did it? Or were you just kind of calm at that point? 
I was I was quite because I've been told it wasn't anything scary I just took that as the face value mm. yeah and I was worried about the biopsy and how it would feel um so basically what they did was uh they did an ultrasound to find you know where they were going to take the biopsy from um and it was just you know one of those needle biopsies um it really wasn't apart from some pressure and like the big click it wasn't it wasn't anything um so they didn't cut your neck and get the whole lymph node out they just took a sample which is often it's enough it's often all they need yeah that was all they needed um and that was sent so that was at um, my local hospital and that was sent to southampton hospital um well they tested it and it came back with lymphoma but mm. they needed to send it to southampton to be able to determine you know the exact type um mm -hmm. and confirm that it was hodgkins yeah because um, i think just to help people who don't know what we're talking about here so um, the majority of lymphomas the vast majority of lymphomas and some of the leukemias including the one i've got all come from lymphocytes so the lymphocytes have become cancerous and so they can see at that initial screen oh we've got cancerous lymphocytes here but then they have to look at them a bit more in detail to identify which of oh my gosh i think it's several hundred different types of blood cancer that there actually are mm. So when they explained that you'd got Hodgkin's lymphoma, I mean, talk to me about that. Was that face to face or was that over the phone because of COVID or what happened? I had an awful experience with my diagnosis. Um, I was due to have a phone call appointment. I think it was um, maybe 11, I think it was like the, the 11 a.m. I know it was 11 a.m. on a Tuesday, I think it was. Um, and I got no phone call. So I phoned them, I was waiting for a phone call. Um, I'm like waiting to find out the results from my biopsy. Um, when will I be phoned? Oh yeah, this afternoon, no phone call came. Called them again the next morning. Oh yeah, we'll phone you this afternoon. Sorry, we're, you know, really busy. Right, okay, phone them, no phone call. I phoned them the next day, we made a complaint because, you know, <laughs> Obviously, we we understood the NHS was un, under so much pressure, but I just couldn't help but feel if this was an in-person appointment, which it would have usually been, I wouldn't have been sat in a waiting room for three days. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. <laughs> um, and I mean, I've had some long waits, but not that long. Yeah, and especially for like the news that you're waiting for, oh, it yeah. it was it was quite bad. Um, and, and so then. I, so from the point of view of referral as well, so this was now, this must have been now like from the time the GP, you know, when you first saw a doctor, we're now talking, what, 20 days at least, was it? Or I can actually it's been tell longer. you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I always... It doesn't really matter, I suppose, but it's just, I it's just a measure of how cold it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for me, while you're looking that up, um, I'll just say for me, I had 19 days um, from being told that, my blood test was abnormal. My um, lymphocyte count was high. There was these funny things called smear cells, which essentially means that the, 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 the lymphocytes were dying. Um, and so that is almost indicative of, of the type of cancer I had, but I had 19 days to wait before I, I got a diagnosis. And I only got the diagnosis by going private, believe it or not. The NHS were just faffing around wouldn't mm -hmm. give me the diagnosis and I don't, it's very bizarre they were just like leaving you in that limbo of sort of a three quarters diagnosis in my case but even if it's just the possibility it's still a horrendous thing because you're you're worrying for all that time you found out how long it was yeah so I can give you like a, a brief timeline so I noticed the lump on the 20th of May and so then 2020 yeah or yeah so yeah. 2020 um Six days later, I had that consultation with my doctor with the blood tests, and he checked my neck. Um, it was right in the middle of COVID. It is worse. Yeah, this was yeah just before the lockdown ended um, in summer. Um, and then, yeah, two days later, the blood test came back fine, but I was referred to the ear, nose, throat department. I had my ultrasound and biopsy on the twelfth of uh, July no June sorry 12th of June 
And on the 18th of June, I got the results. Um, so almost a month between noticing the lump and finding mm. out the results, which I don't think was that bad. Um, yeah, and I, I, I felt very lucky that my doctor dug so quickly mm. and put me through so quickly. Um, but then, yeah, from there, very quick. So 18th, I got the results. 25th, I had my PET scan. And 26th, I had my first chemo session. Right. So, so all systems go, but just let me, let me back up for a moment. You, yeah, you get the phone call. How was that for you? If we're, I don't even, I think this is one of the symptoms of COVID, the, the pandemic. It, it was first of all, very, very quick and out of the blue because, you know, I'd been waiting and I just stopped. I just stopped like sitting by my phone because it had been three days. And so wow. I got so you're just phone. literally sitting in your house in lockdown and suddenly the phone goes. Yeah, I was in my room on my own. Oh, um poor thing. and I just picked up the phone because I didn't even think to like run downstairs or to anyone or anything. And it was a registrar. Was it one of those number withheld calls or something as well? So did you know it, was it, was, it had the number, but um, I it I didn't have any like ID for it. So you had no, yeah. so you had no preparation at all. You just oh, it's the doctor from the hospital. Oh right, yeah. yeah. Um, and then he said, "So I'm sorry to say, but it's come back as as lymphoma. We think it's Hodgkin's lymphoma, but we're sending it off to Southampton to confirm and to confirm the exact type." Um, do you have any questions? I was like, uh, yeah, about a thousand. <laughs> I was just like, my uh, okay. Um, and this point, my like chin was wobbling, but like I was just holding it back because I was like, I was just absolutely shocked. Um, mm. And I was like, what does this mean? Do I have chemo? When do I start? Like, what? And then he was like, well, I can't really answer that because I'm I'm from ENT. I'm, I'm not an oncologist and I was like oh okay well thank you and then just hung up the phone and it was a five minute phone call wow no um, nurse to kind of give you a hug or talk to you afterwards or so yeah it was just like he'd obviously been <laughs> it wasn't the doctor that I was supposed to have the appointment with so he'd obviously been palmed off with this phone call to to give um and wasn't trained to like that's not his special specialty so like Dreadful. not their department that's not what they deal with so um they just said yeah he just said we we referred you to oncology um and so I then had the consultation with my oncologist my hematologist I don't know what to to call him <laughs> I guess he's both um yeah. um because it's the hematology department but I guess yeah um and so I had consultation um five days later and they didn't know whether I'd been told or not so, so that, how was that five days that must have been really difficult because you have no clue I mean did you google stuff or did you keep try and keep away from that or what did you do I, the don't google but I bet you did didn't you I don't really remember. I, I, so I'm always the kind of person that I'm, I don't Google and I, I, ignorance is bliss for me. Uh -huh. um, and I think I played that, I, I did that all the way through. Um, I know that everyone around me was Googling, everyone that I had told. So th those five days were kind of filled with telling family and close friends. Um, and but I it was a weird one because you still don't know what's in store I didn't know whether I was having chemo or not because that phone call didn't tell me anything so I was just still in limbo um and then it was the consultation with the oncologist and that's I went with my mum and and I've got to say it, she was more emotional than I was I was just I think I was just shell shock the whole way through I was just like trying to absorb this information that they were giving me and I was just like 
and then we did the we went into a room with the nurse and talked about a bit more and she gave us some leaflets and booklets and all of that and describing the chemotherapy what it was um how long it would be um yeah and just trying to wrap our heads around it but it it the main thing was just that so the main questions that I went into that consultation was my fertility um and losing my hair whether I could have a cold cap because that's that's the that's the one thing I know what I did in those five days I started listening to a podcast about cancer um I think it's called you me and the big c or something like that it's a bbc podcast I'm pretty sure as uh, yeah um and that was quite good because it was quite light-hearted it it didn't really touch on gruesome stuff but the one thing I had heard about was cold caps and I was like I don't want to lose my thick, gorgeous, blonde hair. Um, and then those two questions are answered very easily with, you don't have time for fertility treatment. Um, and also I'm quite young, don't have a partner to do that with kind of thing. And second, you can't have a cold cap because it's a blood cancer. Um, so that was that. So I was like, right, so... I, I think I was more focused on the fact that I was going to lose my hair and that I might come out of this infertile not not majorly like because I've been reassured that it wasn't a, you know a certain side effect of it but I, it was going through my head that was the first thing that I thought of mm. um but yeah and, and in terms of you know like prognosis and things like that was that something you sort of thought much about at that time or was it not even really much time to think about that because I think this is one of the differences perhaps between like your experience um, where you've been diagnosed with what's a very acute cancer and that's maybe something worth stressing for some people who might be watching this who who have a more chronic blood cancer and and, and those th those two journeys are really quite different because for the chronic one it's basically, yeah, you've got blood cancer. Maybe it's even spread to every part of your body and you've got lymph nodes everywhere and blood, everywhere. but we're not going to do anything. Just leave it until you get sick. You're not sick enough to be treated. And yet your experience is kind of different to that because obviously you weren't feeling sick. Um, and yet they're saying we need to do really quickly mm -hmm. something to save your life, essentially, um, in order to then make you feel very sick. So it's kind of I guess a different journey really, but what, what was that like? I mean, that, that whole process, did you have much chance to, to reflect on the diagnosis or was it literally right down to earth? Let's get this all sorted. What, what, what am I going to put in my bag for my chemo sessions? All of that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was more like that. It was more like, how am I going to get through this chemo? Um, and I think it was just such a, a whirlwind. It was like one of the things that came up when I asked about fertility was that it would just take too long. It he was like, I'm sorry, you just you don't have the time. Because hmm. I um the the PET scan showed that I was stage two. Mm -hmm. Um and he was like, by the time that you could you could do all of that you could be stage four and it could be fatal wow so, so that's pretty shocking it's like look, stop thinking about your hair stop thinking about the possibility of future babies we've got to move and we've got to move quickly what, what? yeah and that's the, that's the thing it was like I was it was made very clear like if this had been left any longer it would have been a, a lot lot worse um and I would have been, been in a quite a sticky situation um but he it was also very reassuring he was like most people get through this chemo quite easily we'll come on to that I didn't um and also that the success rate of this chemo you know is so high there's you know don't worry about not when getting they say success what do they mean success do they mean cure do they mean yeah so going into remission um and then does that does it then come back or does it usually not come back? So yeah, so for 
as far as I'm aware, again, <laughs> not the best person to ask because I have, I do quite literally keep myself ignorant to it all. Um, that's but and that's important because I think people have different strategies and some people want to know everything and some people really don't. So yeah, yeah. you decided to. Yeah, I, I decided not to. I didn't mind other people doing it and then maybe asking them questions, but I didn't want to. Didn't want to know um that's fair enough oh uh, so as far as i'm aware if you're gonna get it again it usually comes within the first year right um and then yeah you're on um you're still an outpatient for five years so you get your three month checkups and then that goes to like i think six months um whatever i don't know <laughs> yeah. um so, yeah but, yeah so that's that's the kind of situation that it is um and, and that's and that's the difference, I suppose, between the acute and the chronic is that the acute ones, obviously, you're in a race against time. And in the past, almost everybody died. Um, that was the reality and quite quickly. But now with treatment, almost everybody lives. Um, and so, you know, that's and, 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 a, and a hard, huge number of those people won't won't get a, a recurrence. And that's true for most of these acute cancers. I mean, obviously, each one's different. And there are obviously some people who who do get into trouble, but you know, generally, that's it's a mm. weird sort of thing, though, isn't it? We're being, we're, you're being, you must have been quite weird being told. On the one hand, look, this is this is trying to kill you and kill you fast, but listen, we're going to help you and we can help you fast, but we've got to we've got to move. Versus the sort of more chronic one where the message seems to be, sorry, we're never really going to be able to get rid of this. Um, it's going to be with you for the rest of your life. Um, but don't worry, it's not going to kill you anytime soon. Um, but you're going to feel worse. And when you feel worse, then we'll treat you and hopefully be a bit better for a while, but then it will come back. So it's, a, it's kind of, a, and, and the problem is, of course, if someone's had that kind of chronic message and they meet somebody who's had the acute message, that there might be a, a miscommunication or vice versa. And the weird thing is, that, so like you have a Hodgkin's lymphoma, which everyone knows is a, a, aggressive. So they don't even call it acute. They just say a Hod Hodgkin which I always think is a weird name. It's just some Victorian gentleman who named it. Um, but then the other group, big group is non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, which actually ironically includes CLL, which is actually leukemia, but hey-ho. So I have a leukemia that's a subtype of a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, mm -hmm. But those, some of those are more acute, like so they would be treated more similarly to yours and others of them are more chronic. And so they'd be treated more similarly to mine. Mm -hmm. Might include things like watching and waiting, which is of course the one thing you couldn't do. Yeah, I I know that, um, uh, so for me, it was like whatever stage that I was, I was still going to get the same treatment. Um, and I knew that, uh, the, I, well, I knew of someone who had non-Hodgkin's and they had a very similar treatment. Mm -hmm. But the thing is with, so, um, you know, with these three month checkups that I've been having, one thing has also been made clear is that if I do get this again, it's going to be a lot worse mm, mm. and it, I'm going to need stem cell transplants and, and the whole shebang and chemo is going to be a lot worse. Um, and he was this, that you really don't want it again. <laughs> that's the, that's the main message is like, you really don't. But um, it's like, how are you supposed to stop that? You know, I know. And every through. time that three month comes up, it's a bit like, Oh God. But that's also like the really good thing about them because that's when you catch them early by having checkups so often but yeah it does that third month I'm always a bit like oh god <laughs> um yeah so it does it does play on your mind but did and do they do scans for you for every three months as well or just just for no, you it's just, just blood tests right. and because um, yes, the very sensitive blood test can pick it up that's the other thing isn't it so it's like yeah just because the normal FPC full blood count doesn't pick it up I guess they yeah. pick it up using their their fancy blood tests and they're also yeah they're also checking things like my, my immune system and and stuff like that um so checking that that's all recovering as well um which it, it was the last time we checked so that's wonderful <laughs> news I mean that's that's great um so just talk a bit though about the experience of chemo because you said it wasn't easy for you no <laughs> And it wasn't easy for anyone around me either. I have to give a shout out to my parents and my family 
just for absolutely carrying me through some of those really dark dark weeks um so i had six months of abvd um the first two cycles um made me neutropenic um and i just i was just my body was just an utter shock i felt so sick um but never vomited i think that was just like it's one of those things where you feel like you want to because you just feel so sick um i didn't have much appetite you know um i had really bad jaw pain um i and like sort of ulcers in my mouth i then also started getting what's it called um neuropathy so i was twitching a lot and and this was all happening at the height of summer as well when it was really really hot we had heat waves over this mm-hmm. period mm-hmm. and it was just so uncomfortable um everything hurt just and I, it this was happening for like so i had one chemo session every um other week I just had no recovery. I had no period of time in between my chemo sessions where I felt okay. Um, maybe like one or two days where I didn't feel sick. Um, but I was just in constant, like, this is horrible. This is the worst. Um, and then, yeah, for the first, I think two cycles, I got called into hospital pulled. Yeah taken into hospital because of different symptoms that you know were worrying um and then we started testing different anti-sickness drugs and and that helped but still was bedridden for at least a week and a half after, after everyone um and just yeah just so ill and just couldn't i just couldn't do anything kind of it just really frustrated me because all the leaflets were like of people who was sort of like their stories being like, yeah, I, you know, would have my chemo on a Friday morning and then by the Monday I'd be in work again and be absolutely fine. And I was just like, yeah, why is this so different for me? Like, and even watching other people go through it after me, I'm like, they're having a great time. But obviously not a great time, but like you, they were having a normal life other than the chemo. And I was just like, I get that this is just I'm only getting, you know, the best bits. But yeah, I was like, they're walking. I mean, <laughs> first of all, um, and I was just it was just horrible. And then my hair started falling out. And when I tell you I had thick hair. I had very thick thick hair. There was a lot of hair to come out and it was just everywhere. And it was just so upsetting to see it just come out. And then it started getting painful because, you know, all of this hair is sort of like kind of being pulled out of its follicles and every, yeah, everything. And then I, my veins closed up. It was so painful to get my treatment put in they couldn't get any blood out (laughs) so did did you have a port in the end or I got a pick line in the end um and that really helped but then because I guess I think it's probably because of your immune system I started getting allergic reactions to a lot of things so um I I mean I still kind of have some scars any the dressings I just, my whole arm became blistered. Um, And the same with any type of cannula. Like I I have a scar in this hand just from where a cannula was put in because my skin was so sensitive. My hands started peeling. They were just constantly hot red and they were peeling. My feet peeled. I, it was just, my body was destroyed by this. Um, and that was with adjustments and stuff. And, and then I started getting, I think maybe the worst symptom for me was um, anticipatory nausea. So mm-hmm. towards the end, um, if anyone doesn't know, um, it it's kind of where the chemo has made you feel sick. 
And so your brain starts making those links with noises, smells, anything that is going on at the time of when you feel sick to link that with that feeling of sickness. So anytime I was just in hospital, I'd feel sick. Anytime I'd smell anti-back, I'd feel sick. Um, I think the first chemo session I had, I had a cup of tea whilst I was having it. I then was sworn off cups of tea. I couldn't drink them. I had a really heightened sense of smell. I couldn't really open the fridge. It just made me feel sick. Um, and that that is sort of like a psychological thing that, that has lasted as well, unfortunately. So, I mean, just the other day I was on a train and there was a beeping noise and it sounded like um oh, the hospital yeah it sounded like the hospital yeah yeah and i i was almost gagging <laughs> oh you poor thing so oh, it, it it does really really affect you and and um my doctor basically what he did was put me on lorazepam um to try and just sedate me a little bit and and get that away but we didn't quite nip it in the bud soon enough for that not to take a, an effect um so yeah I, that was probably the worst bit because it just meant that before i even had chemo i was feeling sick um and i was taking anti-sickness tablets then just on my normal days um, and so it was just kind of like very prolonged because anti-sickness tablets and lorazepam makes you very drowsy and and then I couldn't really do work and my timetable at the, that towards like October November time was working up right up until injection and then bedridden and then working again right up until injection so I could fit everything in so that yeah buggered that <laughs> sorry <laughs> well there you go but you know you made it through didn't you you got to remission we we've already done it's funny we did this kind of backwards so we already did the good news bit um and i guess you you know you're pretty close to that year now as well aren't you um and you're back doing ridiculous numbers of things i mean l l has her finger in a million pies and we unfortunately don't really have time to sort of go into all the things that l does now but like obviously you're not entirely out of the woods in terms of the effect that chemo has on you I get that but you're, you're doing pretty well would you would you say well that's yeah. how it looks to me anyway when I <laughs> hear what you get up to I get exhausted just hearing what you're doing so <laughs> yeah I am quite a busy body um and I am very fortunate to have not bounced back to normal but um bounced back to to an a a normal, normal enough a new normal that makes me feel sane Basically. And you've got a life to look forward to. That's the point, isn't it? And yeah. so this, that's the crucial message, I suppose, for someone watching this maybe in the middle of that dreadful experience of chemo, which isn't always dreadful for everyone. That's the important thing. So if someone's watching this and about to start chemo, they do need to hear that Elle's experience isn't everyone's my, experience. Yeah, that you had uh, one of the I, worst experiences. I, I won't talk about my experience today because mine wasn't brilliant, but yours was even worse than mine. I, yeah, I will put a disclaimer that, my doctor said that he had literally never seen anyone with this many side effects. So just take that as, you know, a pinch of salt so that you know that mine wasn't sort of like an abnormal case. But, that I but if you know. are having that bad experience, maybe you're in hospital, they know what to do. You know, if you have a problem, the doctors know how to handle it. They'll sort you out, they'll get you out, a bit of neutropenia, all of that kind of stuff that yeah. doctors to give you. The injections they really do work those those things you get in the belly i had those too um you know and and actually it's so important at that moment to realize that there's, there is a hope there's a reason you're doing this and and you know l if she hadn't have done this obviously we wouldn't be having this conversation would we so you you went through it you were willing to pay the cost so that you know now thanks to all the work of doctors and researchers and patients critically who volunteered for all those clinical trials um you know you're you're facing a, a bright hopefully future that will mean exactly. that you can you can go out and change the world and believe you me Elle's gonna go change the world in, in the things she does I know from the conversations I've had and and you'll hear more about Elle I hope and um 
I'm going to have to leave it there because we've been talking for a lot longer. Really? Than Sorry, I talked to you I don't yeah. know if, you know, I could keep going, but I think we should probably, um, you know, let, let you go now. And um, all, all the best, Al. So thank you very, very much for joining us. Any last words as you leave? Um, the, no, just thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And it was great. Yeah. It was great chatting. That's great.